When I, an awesome wonder, consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. We love to experience those delightful times when everything, or at least most things, seem to be coming up roses. We love those top-of-the-world times when life seems to be a bed of roses, but life isn't always a bed of roses, is it? Sometimes there are times when the sun goes down, everything seems to be dark, and we don't know where to turn, and we're filled with fear. Back in the 16th century, a priest named St. John of the Cross wrote a poem he called The Dark Night of the Soul. He talked about the experiences that Christians endure as we grow in Christ, as we spiritually mature. Since that time, Christ followers have come to use this phrase, the dark night of the soul, to refer to the adversities and tragedies we encounter during our journey with Christ. Hi, I'm Greg Albrecht. Welcome to CWR Christianity without the religion. You know, the Bible is honest and authentic about the imperfections of our flesh and the misery and hurt that we all will experience in life. The Bible is filled with examples of dark nights of the soul. Sadly and tragically, many within Christendom, have been taught that suffering is not at all part of what a good, quote-unquote, Christian experiences. But, you know, the truth of the Bible lies about 180 degrees away from that. The truth couldn't be more opposed to the idea that good Christians never suffer. Our keynote passage today is but a short comment from a book of Job, from Job chapter 5, verse 7, where we read that, quote, Man is born to trouble as surely as sparks fly upward, end quote. Stay with us as we discuss the real, the difficult, the painful, and the depressing times of life, and how Christ enables us to get through them and past them. Let's pray. Dear God in heaven, we give you thanks that we don't walk this lonesome road called life alone. It's often been said that you don't promise that we will never experience storms in our life, but you do promise you will always be at our side during each and every one of those storms. We thank you for that assurance and for the fact that we have Jesus Christ in our lives. In his precious name we pray. Amen. Our keynote passage is in the book of Job, and I don't have time to give a a several minute or beyond that background to the book of Job, which really this passage calls for. In short, Job, as many of you know, was a prosperous and wealthy man who experienced sudden reversals in his life, tragic losses, enormous losses, including family members. And then he was left with a health crisis. And as he was going through all of the seeking for answers to this and all of the bitterness and the pain that he was going through, the spiritual storm he was enduring, three of his friends came to visit him. And one of them, Eliphaz, said to him, as he commented to Job during Job's miserable health trial, on top of all of the other issues he had to deal with of loss and the grieving he had done over that, he said in Job chapter 5, verse 7, Eliphaz to Job, Yet man is born to trouble as surely as sparks fly upward. If you've ever sat by a campfire, or if you've ever 
observed or built a fire in a fireplace, you know that sparks from a fire inevitably fly upward. That's the word picture Job is painting. Trouble is inevitable. Human beings' trouble comes with the territory. It's part of being human. You will remember the unbelievable suffering and loss of Job. He went from having it all to being left with almost nothing. And the book of Job is a story of Job's dark night of the soul. But it's a book also that touches all of us and each of us, for there are many times when we feel like Job did. Much of the book of Job is his authentic self-disclosure about how he felt when he was going through the dark night of his soul. He felt disconnected from God, and he felt abandoned by God. Have you ever felt that way? I confess to you I have. For the first 30 years or so of my life, while I certainly had times during those first 25, 30, or a few more years than that, when I was challenged by obstacles and problems, I really had no idea of the dark times to come. I'm on the other side of 65 now, and for the last 35, soon to be 40 years of my life, I've experienced several dark nights of my soul. Some people would say any painful experiences I've endured, particularly those who may know of the specifics of some of those painful experiences, were caused by my failure to obey God as I should have. Well, there's no doubt that my stupidity and my stubbornness have directly contributed to many painful experiences I have endured. But more than that, I believe dark nights of the soul are part and parcel of following Christ. My own personal experiences in the past, as well as even now in the present to some degree, lead me to identify four different types of encounters that either on their own or in conjunction with other experiences and events can contribute to a dark night of the soul. The first one, I will freely admit that some of the pain I have endured in my past were of my own doing. We can be the architects of our own dark night of the soul. I know that. I could have avoided many experiences, but then being me, I didn't. Actions have consequences, and I freely admit that I was the architect of many of the nightmares I experienced. Some of these individual choices were themselves a dark night of the soul. But there's a second way in which we experience a dark night of the soul, and that is this. There have also been other people in my life, or associated with my life, or attached to my life, who made unwanted and uninvited contributions to dark times of my life. They contributed to other nightmares. Some of these people have completely left my life now. Some I haven't seen for several decades, and some are deceased. But you know, trouble and controversy thrives wherever people are. That again goes with the territory. I think that our passage in Job is saying that. I still have relationships of one kind or another with some people who in their own way present troubling challenges for me. I don't think we ever get away from that in our lives. So the second type of painful experience that we can have which contributes to a dark night of our soul might be said to be caused by other people. That is, other people have a way of bringing darkness into our lives. Now, of course, Having said that, let's pause a moment. When we think about other people hurting us and causing pain and heartache in our lives, we then must be brutally honest and realize that there were times, hopefully all of them or most of them in our past, when we brought darkness and pain into other people's lives as well. Thinking that, realizing that should drive us to our knees and help us to inquire of God, to help us to see when and where, if we still are doing such a thing, that we might be a thorn in someone's side now, so that we might change that relationship. But here's the conclusion to this second kind of pain. While friends and family can bring us joy and happiness, they can also bring no end of grief and heartache. And since we're part of friends and family, we too can bring no end of grief and heartache 
to other people's lives. If you never want to be hurt, then never allow anyone to come into a close relationship with you. Other people can be burrs under our saddle and we burrs under theirs. Sometimes people change. Sometimes God calls them to repentance, but there may be people in your life or in mine who will remain the old cantankerous person they have always been until the end of our life. If you really have no idea what I'm talking about because your life has been one continuous day at the beach, one happy moment after another, one continual walk in a rose garden, then all you need to do is turn your television on and watch one of those unending self-help counseling talk shows on television like, say, Dr. Phil, where people bare their souls. Thirdly, a third kind of painful experience that can become and contribute to a dark night of your soul. For me, another time in my life that contributed and in fact was a dark night of my soul was a intense, humiliating, and depressing period of time that lasted about five years or so. I often think of this time as a time when I walked through the valley of death, through the shadow of the valley of death. It was a time when I slowly but surely realized that almost everything that I had thought God to be and represent, everything I thought God was, and almost everything I thought He wanted me to do, and almost everything I thought about the way in which I related to God and he related to me was wrong. My view of God, my understanding of God wasn't just a little bit wrong. It was well and truly screwed up. Spiritually speaking, I began to see I was one messed up little camper. That dark night of the soul was one of the most troubling of all I have experienced. There were times when I doubted during this five or so year period of time, my own sanity. There were times when I was mad as hell at God. There were times when I started to wonder whether God even existed. So the third type of a dark night of our soul that we can experience in one way or another has to do with our relationship with God. When we initially really come to know God as he is, and when we really come to Jesus and accept him for who and what he is, we will discover that the road to the joy and glory of new life in Christ, his resurrection, runs through the graveyard of our lives. It doesn't run through just a couple little band-aids on our owies and boo-boos. It runs through the graveyard. God's grace is free, but the cost of fully embracing his grace is steep. It's incredibly expensive. The cost is our life and the way we've lived it, and the way we want to live it. The cost is the death of ourselves so that we may, using the words of Paul in Philippians chapter 3, gain Christ. For truly, the way we want to naturally live in this flesh cannot coexist with the grace of our Lord. It's one or the other. You may know about this particular third type of painful experience, this painful spiritual experience, and if you do, then you have a few of your own stories to tell about the dark nights of your soul and the fourth kind of experience that can contribute to a dark night of our soul concerns physical pain, disabilities, accidents that we may suffer and experience, diseases that may come into our lives or the lives of our loved ones. It concerns the grief we experience when we lose loved ones to death, the grief we experience when we may have a health crisis or a debilitating accident that we go through and endure, or when one of our loved ones does. And when all we can do is just watch, and we often say, all I can do is pray. And oftentimes people think of that as the last resort. And of course, prayer should never be the last resort. But oftentimes, unfortunately, it is. I'm no stranger to this kind of intense pain and grief. Again, I suspect, in fact, in the future, many more such experiences will come my way because that's the lot of what it means to be human. And beyond that, it is specifically the lot of what it means to walk with Jesus and to suffer with him. 
When I consider these four kinds of destructive experiences, I realize that they don't always individually add up to the intensity of what we might call, you know, like a, a force eight hurricane or a stage, what would a, the earthquake, a, a number seven on the Richter scale earthquake. They don't add up maybe to the intensity of, the, of what we might call a dark night of our soul. On the other hand, I can also say from my own experience and many decades of listening to what others have related to me about their own pain and heartache, some pain and afflictions never really go away. They may not always boil over into an intense dark night of the soul, but in some cases, this pain just goes on and on and on and on like a nagging toothache or your joints being in pain or the difficulty you have with arthritis. I know about that kind of experience, and I am aware of it, even now. I deeply relate, as many of you do, with a comment made by the famous American author F. Scott Fitzgerald when he said, in a real dark night of the soul, it's always three o'clock in the morning. And that's really one of the worst times, isn't it? In the middle of the night, early in the morning, you wake up in a cold sweat, You're troubled. You're worried. There doesn't seem to be any way out of a situation in which you find yourself. I know of two of my dear friends who are in such predicaments right now, one in a health crisis, one in an intense financial crisis. And I realize that all of our situations vary. No one of us have the same kinds of experiences. I also am very thankful that God has blessed my wife and I in so many ways and made his presence known to us and comforted us in so many ways. I can't complain that God has left me. He's always been with me faithfully. As I journey with Christ, he walks right there next to me. He hasn't removed the trials about which I speak, but he hasn't left me either. We all tend to think that God will always, at the very least, turn our mountains into molehills. And sometimes he does that. And we think and pray and ask God to completely take away the mountains that we face. Just obliterate them. Just blow them up. And sometimes he does that. But there are also times as we walk with Christ that Jesus will beckon to us to simply follow him as he faces the mountain head on and we climb over the mountain. Jesus didn't run from suffering in his own life. He faced it. So sometimes the mountain in your life and in mine will remain. It will be a mountain. Perhaps we'll be climbing the rest of our lives or several mountains, if you like. Here's what you and I need to know about the dark nights of the soul, those troubles we surely experience just as surely as the sparks from a campfire fly upward. The dark nights of our soul can be and often are a time when we connect with God when we sense and feel his presence, when we draw near to him in unique and special ways, dark nights of our soul can mean that we experience a a deeper, a higher level of intimacy with God than we would have had we not gone through or been in the process of going through a deeply troubling time. All Christ followers, if we really are following Christ, will experience dark nights of their soul. Many passages in the New Testament speak to that. Above all, we must remember that life in Christ reminds us that our spiritual death must precede new life in Christ. Sometimes we think that we are now a Christ follower and that our past is behind us and that we surrendered all to Christ in the past, only to find when we look around and we really consider something that's going on in our life that we've really stopped walking next to Jesus Christ, or we've slowed down, or we're on the side of the road, or in fact, we're not even walking on the road anymore with Jesus. We're wallowing in the ditch, because what we've been doing, and part of the dark night of the soul that we're experiencing, is trying to bring some part of our past lives we once surrendered to him back into our life. And of course, when we're in that ditch, we find ourselves face to face, nose to nose with a lot of rubbish, garbage, and swill. Our lives in Christ are an ongoing battle to remain next to him, close to him. But sadly, there are times when we fall into, or sometimes when we jump into, a ditch, or to be more graphic, a sewer, or a cesspool. 
sometimes a dark night of our soul can help us to realize that, you know, we've been walking the other direction from Jesus. We stopped walking with him. We're in a ditch. We're wallowing in some temporal or spiritually immature pursuit. And so that can be a benefit as we reassess and reach out to Jesus as he extends his hand to us to help us out of the ditch once again. When dark nights of the soul happen, and I'm speaking of those not because of something we did, not consequential or caused by our own actions, but they happen because of the pain others cause us, or maybe because of accidents, disease, or death. We are then more open in the midst of our pain to realize one of the most important things we can realize about our life in Christ. We have no control over our lives. Realizing we have no control over our lives can be spiritually meaningful and deeply helpful to us. Because, you see, control is what human beings naturally want to have. Control is what human beings spend most of our lives trying to achieve, financial control. We try to achieve good health. We try to put our money in the bank. We try to make sure that we can buy a plot of property. We try to be in control of our relationships with our children by telling them what they should do and how they should act, or maybe with our wife or our spouse. And we actually, believe it or not, come to the point where if we succumb to the temptations of Christless religion, think we can control God. Control is not what freedom in Christ is all about. Control is not what God's grace promises and produces. Control is a false promise of the false gods of institutionalized big business religion. In order to be in relationship with God, we must surrender control or more than that, we must surrender the idea, the mirage, the illusion of control, because any control we think we have over our lives is an illusion. Or maybe even worse, it's a lie. Dark nights of the soul can remind us of the truth that in order to put on Christ, in order for the risen Lord to live in us and for us to live in him, we must surrender and that we must be in the process of, as Paul says in Corinthians, being renewed day by day. That is, as Paul so often described it in other places, our old man must die and remain dead. Dying is the only path to new life in Christ. There is no shortcut. The road to the resurrection runs straight through the cemetery. And finally, as we conclude, Knowing Christ, as Paul talks about in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, we won't turn there. In fact, last week we were reading from that passage. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, Paul says that knowing Christ means experiencing both the death of the old man and the new life, the resurrection of our new man, our new self, as well as participating in the sufferings of Jesus and his death. So that, again, first, our old man dies. And that's part of what the dark nights of our soul are all about. And then we live in Christ, eternally and forever, in and through our risen Lord. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for this time when we've been able to take a little deeper look at these painful and problematic times in our lives. However they may come, why they come, what the answer for them all is, we probably will never know. But we do know that through them, enduring them, out of them, we walk in Christ and you may grow and build in us the new man that you are creating. Thank you for that. Please be with many of our friends, our partners around this world, and not just our friends and partners, but people who are experiencing dark nights of their soul. Nourish them, guide them, and inspire them, and lead them to Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And we do pray for all of you, wherever you may be around this world, for any dark nights of the soul you may be going through, and you may write to us, email us, and let us know of your specific concerns in that regard. Join us next week for our message again from the book of Job, chapter 41, verse 11, titled, Let's Make a Deal.
Job chapter 41, verse 11. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Then sing my soul, my Savior God.